Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Lindsay Cloud, and I am the director of the Policy Surveillance Program here at the Center for Public Health All Research. And I lead a team of lawyers that work across many of the topics that will be discussed today. Um, I'm so pleased to be moderating this session on reproductive rights. Uh, I have such a great panel um, here with us that we work with collaboratively at the center. Um, so as you know, abortion is a critical component of healthcare and is a very common practice with one in four women receiving an abortion by the age of 45. We also know that since the landmark decision of Roe v. Wade in 1973, abortion has become one of the most highly regulated procedures in the US. So 2019 has been an especially uh, banner year for reproductive rights advocates with over 400 legislative measures being introduced across the states in six months from January to June. So we all know that there is a need for evidence-based lawmaking. And with hotly contested topics such as abortion, this is even more of a priority. And we know abortion has a long-standing history of being controversial and politically charged. Legal epi has the unique ability to cut through all of that controversy. And what I mean by that is it's cutting through the noise because we are objectively measuring the features of the law. We're not pulling out what we think the law says or what we want it to say. We are pulling out what the law, what we can measure from these abortion laws. So the panelists here today are going to take us through their fantastic work um, under an overarching framework of how they use public health law research methods in all of their projects. And the purpose of all of this is to understand the effects of abortion restrictions across the US and also globally. So although they may need no introduction, um, let me introduce each in the order that you will be hearing from them. So we'll be starting out with Patty Schuster. Uh, she's an expert in the regulation of abortion globally. She serves as the senior legal advisor at IPASS, where she develops innovative projects on laws, human rights, abortion care. She also researches US foreign policy, legal risk in humanitarian settings, abortion with pills, and other emergent legal issues. She's also a fellow with the Center for Public Health Law Research and has been working with us on our abortion law projects. She's going to be here today to discuss um, the public health law research for understanding abortion laws globally. She's doing a project right now with the center looking at over 203 country level laws on self-managed abortion. She's also going to be discussing um, the work we're doing with the World Health Organization uh, that's looking at evidence in relation to laws and policies and public health impacts in six public health law domains. Next up will be David Cohen, who is a professor of law at Drexel University School of Law. There, Professor Cohen uh, teaches constitutional law and sex, gender, and the law. His scholarship explores the intersection of constitutional law and gender, emphasizing how the law impacts abortion provision, including violence against providers, as well as sex seg segregation and masculinity. David's going to focus on the impact of trap laws, which are targeted regulation of abortion provider laws that was explored in his new book um, through a series of national interviews. Uh, David will be followed by Kelly Sidman Hall, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Behavioral Sciences and Health Education Epidemiology at Emory University. She's the founding director and principal investigator of the Center for Reproductive Health Research in the Southeast, also known as the RISE Center at Emory. Dr. Hall's research uses biosocial framework, so, social ecological perspective, and interdisciplinary approach to understand and address the multi-level social determinants of reproductive health. She's here today to talk about reproductive health generally and taking us through the RISE Center projects, um, including uh, 
you know, everything from a Southeast perspective. Um, then she will turn it over to Rachel, who also works on the RISE Center project. Rachel Rebouchet is the Associate Dean for Research at Temple University Beasley School of Law, where she teaches family law, healthcare law, and contracts. She is a faculty fellow at our center and is currently co-investigator on two grant-funded research projects related to reproductive health. Rachel is going to do a deeper dive into one of RISE's projects that focus on parental involvement laws. So without further ado, let me turn this over to Patty. Thanks very much. Um, I'm really excited to be here. This is, I'm, I'm relatively new, just the past couple of years to the work of the Center in Legal Epidemiology. And, um, and I'm, I'm thrilled to discover it and um, really talk about why during my presentation. Um, so as Lindsay mentioned, I work for IPASS, which is a global uh, reproductive rights organization, primarily public health folks that I work with. And we work on promoting access to abortion. We work in about 40 countries, primarily in the global south. Um, I'm, I'm affiliated with the headquarters, which um, works on technical assistance. We also do research and um, in advocacy, global abortion advocacy. Um, so I'm a lawyer and I sit in this public health organization and I've been there for um, 14 years now trying to solve legal health problems with my public health colleagues and researchers. And we've kind of been for many years talking past each other and um, really not being able to define questions together. And, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm really delighted to um, know the work of the center to find tools in a common language so that we can really identify problems and um, find solutions together. So I'm going to be talking about two global abortion law projects that I'm working with um, the center on. One, as Lindsay said, is um, mapping laws around the world on self-managed abortion. And the second is in identifying data for the empirical assessment of abortion laws uh, with WHO. Um, but as I share details on the two projects, I also want to share some context um, to show how legal epidemiology is so useful for the precision we need to identify laws and policies and also to help us prioritize, um, particularly in my case, our legal reform efforts. Uh, and precision is really the value of the project, um, the first project that I mentioned uh, that is working with the legal policy surveillance team um, with policy surveillance methods on, to um, map laws on self-managed abortion. And without policy surveillance methods, um, I'm going to kind of follow in the footsteps of the first panel to, to, to share a story of struggle of how we do cross-jurisdictional comparisons without legal epidemiology methods. Um, so here's my example. There, there's one question um, as the lawyer at, at IPASS, the Global Public Health Abortion Organization. There's one question that I get asked again and again. I must have answered this question about 50 times. Um, and it's a question about what country, how many countries in the world totally ban abortion? And this is of interest to researchers. They always want to include it in an article. It's, it's certainly whenever there's a law change that's reported in the media, the media wants to talk about how many laws um, ban abortion around the world. And so IPASS has to have an answer. And, it's, and we've puzzled over it. Um, I mean, do, do we include only countries like El Salvador that explicitly banned abortion um, when a woman's life is at risk? Uh, many countries, the uh, defense that the abortion was necessary to save a woman's life might be might work in court to be include those countries. Um, Dominican Republic, abortion uh, was recently addressed in the Constitution. Does that does that count? So I've been back and forth with discussions with colleagues. They're like, what about this country? What about this country? And finally, I just landed on six. Six is the number, and here are all the qualifiers, and this is how. And that worked for, I don't know, three or four years, it was six. IPASS says there's six countries. Um, and then just last week, my um, colleague wrote, okay, we've been saying six, but this other reputable organization that works on legal issues is saying 20 something. Why, where did that number come from? And I mean, I have no idea. And they're, and they're asking me as though I should know how they came up with their number 20. And so legal epidemiology really um, gets us out of this mess and policy surveillance methods in particular. Um, they can uh, help us answer precise questions about across jurisdictions. And so IPASS, we work globally, and we need to be able to identify trends in the laws and problems in abortion laws 
so that we can work to address them. Um, and self-managed abortion, people who have abortions without interfacing with the public health system, that proposes one of the legal problems that we're trying to solve. Um, so abortion is different than a lot of healthcare services. Uh, it's regulated by the criminal law all over the world. Um, so people who have abortions outside the, the requirements of the law might face imprisonment, which is different than a lot of other healthcare um, issues. And all over the world, including the US, uh, people who want to end their pregnancies are figuring out how to do that without interacting with the formal healthcare system because of legal restrictions largely, also because of other barriers that they may face. Um, and abortion pills, misoprostol and mifepristone or misoprostol alone have really changed the landscape of abortion. Increasingly, pregnant people are able to get abortion information and drugs um, from the internet. Um, as has been in the news of the interests of the FDA here in the US or from community groups or from their neighbors, their friends. Um, and many of those abortions are safe. But across the globe, um, most of the laws that were written to regulate abortion were written with surgical abortion in mind. Um, abortions that require more training and um, qualifications that, that might be done by doctors or nurses or midwives. Um, and so most national laws around the world criminalize people who self-manage their abortion and also the people that help them. So IPASS is working toward legal recommendations. This is how you should write a law to legalize people and the people who help them self-manage um, their abortion, which all of that is background for the self-managed abortion project where we're using policy surveillance methods to map laws on um, self-managed abortion using text of the laws collected um, by WHO. So I'm working with Adrian and the policy surveillance team to answer eight questions about how abortion laws apply to self-managed abortion um, across over 200 jurisdictions. Um, and there are questions like, where must an abortion take place in order to be legal? Or who is legally um, able to provide an abortion? So at the end of the project, which um, within a month or two, we'll talk about that later, we will know the areas of the law around the world that need attention in order to enable people to self-manage their abortion. And IPASS as an organization will be able to make recommendations for legal and policy reform at the global level at UN bodies um, and for our friends at ministries of health and local advocates. But not only that, I'm hoping that eventually we'll be able to investigate health outcomes and crim criminal prosecutions as well, so that we'll be able to make comparisons across jurisdictions um, and understand how different laws might lead to different outcomes. And then really get a better handle on how do you effectively reform law to ensure that people can self-manage their abortions without risk of arrest or imprisonment. So now I'm going to turn to my second project with the center that um, that's the center's project with the World Health Organization on identifying data for the empirical assessment of abortion laws. And I'm just going to call it the WHO ideal project. And it was designed by Rachel and Scott. And I had the honor of kind of being pulled into it, which um, which is very exciting for me. Um, and I and I really think this project is going to uh, eventually shift the way that we prioritize um, legal reform efforts for IPASS in the whole field. So, um, so I'm going to spend most of my time kind of putting the project in context because the context is really important. Um, the World Health Organization issues guidance on abortion care and they issue guidance on clinical health systems and policy policies on abortion. They make recommendations um, on how to how to enable abortion access in those three areas. Um, the second edition of the guidance was, uh, was released in 2002, and now the WHO is working on a, um, a third edition, and the IDEAL project is going to uh, shape the approach. Um, and the WHO approach to policy recommendations is really important because um, WHO recommendations really shape not only global NGOs like IPASS, but also how local advocates, ministries of health, and parliaments even reform um, abortion laws and policies. And the WHO approach to law and policy um, until now has been to identify barriers to abortion and law and policy and recommend that governments remove those barriers. So WHO says, these are the barriers to abortion, governments, you should remove them. 
there's something like 10 of them out there in the current guidance, things like um, that people are familiar with, like parental consent requirements, um, waiting periods. And in the most recent edition of the guidance, WHO made these recommendations and said the basis of recommendations are human rights. Human rights says remove those barriers because human rights says that those barriers need to go. But in, in, I want to contrast that approach to how WHO makes clinical and health systems recommendations typically. The clinical and health systems recommendations are based in research on evidence. So previously we had human rights based policy recommendations, evidence based clinical and health systems recommendations. But because of the work of the center, there's change of foot in the policy and legal recommendations that come up at WHO. So through the ideal project, um, um, the uh, center is helping WHO make evidence, evidence, evidence based policy recommendations. I'm just saying that clinical and health systems recommendations are based. But we have a problem with that. And that is, we don't like health systems and clinical issues. We don't have a lot of evidence on direct in some cases. We don't have a lot of evidence on direct um, you have good impacts and impact of barriers at the The ideal project um, centers both from a causal model to identify the evidence that possibly lead to um, possibly be an outcome of health policy. Not only the direct evidence, but also the evidence that might result um, in the policy as well. So I'm just going to give a very simplified example. Um, so let's just say we know that parental consent requirements cause abortion services, um, or they could cause abortion services to be delayed until later in pregnancy. You have to get consent, then it's going to take longer for you to get um, an abortion. And we might also have data that shows that later abortions are more expensive. So um, we might plausibly say that parental consent requirements lead to higher cost for a health system in particular. And so that's really important, um, in, in particularly in context where IPASS works, where ministries of health are actually in charge of health systems, which is different than our context in the US. And those health systems offer abortion free of charge for people who can't pay for them. So ministries of health are really keenly interested in the cost of abortion for the health system. And so if we can show that parental consent requirements, just for a simplified example, lead to higher costs, um, we can certainly get the attention of our health ministries, as well as the legislatures who, um, who appropriate money for them. Um, and in our old approach to law reform, um, what we would do, and I'm going to call it the old approach, even though we haven't changed yet, but we will, um, we would sort of look at WHO's list of 10 policy barriers, um, and with advocates and policymakers, um, figure out how to remove them. And we have this list of 10. And we kind of use, I guess, intuition or something to figure out which one is most important. Is parental consent most important? Are waiting periods most important? Which one should we focus on? But um, the WHO ideal project will lead to evidence of the impact of abortion policy so we can make better decisions. Um, and it's going to go like this. So WHO is going to take the data from the ideal project and then lead to systematic reviews on the health outcomes that have been identified and then find that there isn't a whole lot of literature, a whole lot of research on certain areas. And so WHO is going to identify research gaps, and this is the piece I'm most excited about. And then those research gaps will be addressed by organizations like IPASS and our partners to figure out, okay, what is the, what is the, the what are the health outcomes? What are the social outcomes of abortion barriers? Um, and so that that will really enable us to promote those very abortion policies that are going to most effectively um, improve health and lives. Thanks. Um, Hello, and thanks to um, uh, Lindsay for moderating this panel, Rachel for inviting me. Um, I want to apologize out uh, up front that I have to leave to catch a flight. Um, at, so I'm going to bolt around exactly at noon. Um, so I won't be able to stick around for the whole Q&A. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about 
the, the book that is, I'm about to publish with my co-author, Carol Jaffe, who's a sociologist in California, um, and uh, sort of using qualitative methods to um, you, uh, bolster the quantitative research and other research that's done by other le uh, legal and health, public health researchers around the world of abortion. Um, because neither of us are quantitative people or epidemiologists or legal epidemiologists, um, but um, we use all of the research that others in this field um, produce to um, tell the story of abortion in America at this point in time. Um, so I want to start by telling the story of a patient in the United States trying to get an abortion, um, one patient's story. Consider Talia's story of trying to get her abortion. Talia was 15 years old and had just started getting her period earlier in the year. As happens with many young women, her period was erratic, so she didn't realize she was pregnant until seven, several months had gone by. When she did find out, having just graduated middle school and essentially raising herself thanks to absent parents, she was certain she wanted and needed an abortion. But making the decision herself was not an option for Talia. Like young women in about three quarters of the states, as, as a minor, Talia was not entitled to make her own choice. In her state, one parent had to be notified and give consent to the abortion. The consenting parent had to provide government-issued ID so the consent could be notarized. Talia had the adult support of an adult in her life, a grandparent, but she didn't qualify under the law as a person who could consent. With one parent missing and the other one sporadically involved in her life, Talia's only option was to go before a judge who would then consent, uh, sign off on the abortion. Going before a judge in any circumstance is not an experience most people relish, especially minors, um, especially minors faced with an unwanted pregnancy. Thankfully, Talia lived in a state that had a well-run organization to help her with this process. Talia contacted the organization who connected her with an attorney to help her fill out the paperwork and appear before the judge. However, before she could do that, because her state also had a requirement that she had to get informed consent at the clinic before she had her abortion 24 hours ahead of time, um, Talia had to make this separate trip to the clinic ahead of time. She made the appointment and showed up at the clinic for her pre-abortion counseling and ultrasound. When she got to the clinic, she realized something was wrong. The building she entered wasn't an abortion clinic after all. Rather, she was in a fake women's health center, uh, generically known as a crisis pregnancy center, sometimes called CPCs, but also sometimes called fake clinics. This center, which was not a medical facility, but rather posed as one, was located directly next door to the real abortion clinic and did everything it could to try to make itself look like the clinic. Same building design, very similar name. Talia was tricked into going there. Once she was inside, before she realized all of this, the people there who wore white coats to look like doctors pretended they knew Talia had an appointment. But when Talia told them she wanted to have an abortion, they tried to persuade her otherwise. They told her they would help her support her baby with money and other forms of assistance. When Talia remained confident in her decision, they brought someone in who told Talia that she herself had an abortion and that it had ruined her life. Finally, when Talia said she still wanted an abortion, the people at the center brought out the most dangerous lie of them all. They told Talia they could perform the abortion, but that Talia would have to wait a few weeks because they didn't have an open appointment. Ty was already 19 weeks pregnant and waiting a few weeks would have put her over her state's gestational limit for having an abortion. In other words, the center lied to Talia so she would never be able to exercise her right to choose. When she left her appointment at the fake clinic, she called the organization that helped minors through this process as a whole. The people there quickly identified the fake clinic and told Talia she was at the wrong place. Talia was shocked. She said, I thought I was in a real doctor's office. I don't get it. Thanks to the help of the organization, the attorney, and then the real clinic, Talia was able to get the judge's approval without any problems. But her journey wasn't over there. She still needed to come up with the money. She didn't have health insurance that covered the abortion, so she had to come up with $4,000 out of pocket. She and her boyfriend's grandmother pulled together some money, but it wasn't enough. Thankfully, local and national organizations dedicated to helping low-income women pay for abortions stepped in. They made up the difference, and Talia was able to get her abortion just before the state's limit kicked in. With her abortion behind her, Talia started ninth grade, free to pursue her education without being a parent that she didn't want to be. But for her to get to this point, she had to navigate the complex web of laws that deprive young women 
of their autonomous decision making that require people to make an unnecessary trip to a clinic 24 hours ahead of time that low uh, the time pressure of a state's gestational limit and the difficulty that low-income people have in finding money when their insurance doesn't cover abortion tali was successful but with so many hurdles in place other women aren't always so fortunate Talia's story is emblematic of the many, though certainly not all, abortion patients who face multiple compounding roadblocks in their search for care. It highlights the wide variety of obstacles standing in the way of people accessing abortion in this country. These struggles to get an abortion differ significantly from the accounts of other Americans' efforts to access healthcare services. Of course, many people face difficulties getting healthcare they need in this country. Too many Americans remain uninsured, or underinsured, many who live outside population areas, have, or outside population centers, have to travel long distances, and wait times to be seen by providers can be excessive. These and other problems are endemic to all forms of medical care in the United States. But what Talia's story and others like it highlight are just a few of the many difficulties that women in the United States have in accessing abortion care because of barriers specific to abortion. These barriers represent abortion exceptionalism, the idea that abortion is treated uniquely compared to other medical procedures that are comparable to abortion in complexity and safety. These barriers thwart access to care in ways that compound the other problems that are shared by many people who seek other forms of medical care. These barriers are about abortion and abortion alone. In spite of the extensive literature that exists on almost every aspect of abortion, relatively little has been written documenting the actual experience of getting an abortion amid all of the obstacles in America today. Carol Jaffe, my co-author, and I have set out to remedy this gap in this literature. Both of us are scholars of abortion, me from the legal world, Carol from sociology, and we have long known the difficulties that patients face in accessing abortion care in this country, and that abortion providers face in providing quality medical care, despite political interference. But we both decided that a full accounting of these obstacles from the moment a woman finds out she's pregnant through, if she's successful, getting the abortion she seeks is essential to understanding the reality of abortion in this country, in contemporary America. For these reasons, we wrote our book, Telling the Story of Abortion Now, a story that captures the disturbing reality of the sometimes insurmountable barriers women face trying to exercise their constitutional right to a basic medical procedure. This book called Obstacle Course, The Everyday Struggle to Get an Abortion in America, it's coming out in January, is based largely on more than 75 interviews that we conducted in 2017 and 2018. We interviewed people working in all 50 states, as well as the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. We interviewed abortion providers, those who work in various jobs in clinics or hospitals that provide abortions, not just doctors, but everyone involved in providing abortions, as well as abortion access allies and volunteers. As we use the terms, an ally, uh, allies are people who are not in an abortion facility providing abortions, but instead work for an outside organization that helps patients access abortion. Think the people in Talia's story who helped fund, get her funds for her abortion or helped her navigate the process with the judge. Volunteers are people who are not paid to provide this support, but do so, do so on their own time. The people we interviewed spanned various jobs in the world of abortion provision and represented the various settings where abortions take place, local Planned Parenthood affiliates, independent clinics, hospitals, doctor's offices, though consistent with abortion provision generally, most were from the first two categories. Our interviews with providers, allies, and volunteers covered three main topics. First, we discussed the barriers patients face in accessing abortion where they, uh, in the places where these people work. Second, we discussed how quality abortion care or access is made available in light of those barriers. And third, we discussed how these barriers affect the people that they see. By talking with providers, allies, and volunteers from every state and every major territory in this country, we were able to get a complete picture of the comprehensive nature of the various barriers that exist around the country, how abortion care managed to be provided despite these barriers, and how they affect abortion-seeking people. To complement the original interviews throughout the book, we draw heavily on other sources, 
There are an increasing number of people in this country who have been public about telling their abortion stories, and we've used many, we use many of those stories throughout the book. Additionally, throughout the book, we cite relevant empirical research from many different fields that has documented the barriers patients face, as well as the benefits or lack thereof that these barriers may have. Um, we organize the book um, from the, as each different step in the process, from learning you're pregnant to if successful getting a procedure. In order, we cover uh, the decision to have an abortion with special attention paid for minors, finding and getting to an abortion provider, paying for the abortion, finding and getting, uh, sorry, getting into the abortion clinic, counseling at the clinic, waiting before the procedure and the procedure itself. Not every abortion follows this linear progression from start to finish, but this ordering is a sensible way to think about the abortion restrictions around the country and each spot, each step along the way that they impact a person's experience getting an abortion. By covering this, we don't focus on, any, by covering uh, abortion this way, we're not focusing on any one state or territory, nor are we claiming that every or even any woman in the United States faces each one of these barriers. Um, there are different abortion paths throughout this country, with some people facing many of these barriers and others facing almost none. In the end, what the book, uh, the takeaways from the book, what the book concludes is that the myriad barriers that exist around the country, such as those highlighted by Talia's story, make it extremely difficult for people, particularly those who are poor and racial minorities, to access abortion services. Nevertheless, for the most part, thanks to their own commitment, as well as the dedication and innovation of providers, allies, and volunteers, women in America who seek abortion still, for now, do get safe, legal abortions. As one abortion provider told us, women will walk over hot rocks to find an abortion. If you need one, you need one, and you go where you can. Um, uh, so the, um, a few uh, additional points related to that. Um, restrictions that make abortion more and more difficult for women uh, uh, to access abortion are multiplying, but we have not yet seen, we have seen a drop in the numbers of abortions, but to the best that public health researchers have been able to tell, it is not because of those restrictions. The drop in the numbers of abortion has not been an, uh, 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 also seen an increase in the number of unwanted uh, pregnancies and childbirths. Rather, it's largely attributed to the increase in the access and use of effective contraception. Um, and then also the drop has been partly because of the increase in self-managed abortion, although that is hard to measure in this country. There are people who do measure it, but they don't know exact numbers. Um, the Guttmacher Institute, which produces the most reliable numbers with the, uh, the number of abortions in this country is coming out with new numbers for 2017 next week. Um, that undoubtedly will uh, make headlines about the numbers of abortions in this country. Um, the obstacles that people face in getting an abortion around decision, traveling, paying, protests, counseling, uh, waiting, the medical procedure itself are unparalleled in medicine. And yet in spite of these obstacles, um, most people who want an abortion in this country get it. It requires the determination and innovation of abortion providers, volunteers, and allies to do so. It involves people having to move mountains to access care for themselves as well. But we conclude in the book, as should not be a surprise, that women should not have to move mountains to get basic health care, and that providers should not have to um, uh, be innovative in ways that go beyond basic medical innovation to provide good medical care because of the burdens that law puts on their practice. Rather, law should treat abortion as any other medical service and require the same legal requirements that are provided for other forms of health care and nothing more. Thank you very much. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Kelly Stidham Hall I'm from Emory University. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for the invitation to Lindsay and Rachel and Scott. Um, I'm also grateful to um, Patty and David for 
uh, and, and Lindsay too, for um, providing some awesome context to set up what I'm going to be talking about today, which is um, our experience in building, sort of envisioning and building a, a, a research center dedicated to understanding and addressing the social determinants of reproductive health, specifically health policies um, as they shape access to care and service delivery in the southeastern United States. So I'm going to be drilling it down to the southeast, not unlike what Lindsay described as the onslaught of restrictive policies that have that our country's faced um, on a national level over the past decade and especially over the past few years, uh, the Southeast in some ways has disproportionately been impacted by those policies. We're in a very um, conservative socio-political climate. Um, and we also really suffer from very high rates, the highest rates, in fact, in the nation, uh, in Georgia and surrounding states of adverse reproductive health outcomes. So highest rates of unintended pregnancy, the highest rates of adolescent birth, and the highest rates of maternal mortality and infant mortality in the nation. And um, not dissimilar from um, some of the context that Patty described with the global Southeast, the, the Southeastern United States um, is more similar to some of those global context, um, under-resourced global context, than it is to our peers in um, developing uh, developed countries. So, when I got to Emory four years ago, um, I was charged with the uh, with the task of envisioning and developing and building a team um, to think about how can we build research capacity to study what's happening in our own backyard. So, how can we um, think about setting up a scientific program, a comprehensive scientific program um, from within in engaging with community partners and communities from within Georgia, from within Mississippi and Alabama and Florida and Tennessee and North Carolina and South Carolina to um, really do a good job at, a rigorous job at um, scientifically evaluating the impact of policies on health outcomes for our, um, our communities. And so um, I was fortunate to have a strong foundation in maternal child health research before me at Emory and with some of our local organizations. So I felt like the stars had aligned for me and uh, for my team at Emory. And so we um, started building what we thought would be the necessary components for a very comprehensive program with research at the core of what we were doing um, and building a robust set of scientific studies to evaluate the most timely and most pertinent reproductive health policy issues and service delivery issues in our state. Um, but also, how can we think about the, the most complementary pieces of that um, from an education and um, training standpoint? So thinking about the pipeline of scientists who can stay and build capacity in the region, as well as thinking about the translation piece and the community engagement piece very intentionally, very proactively. Um, and uh, so what does it look like to have a research agenda shaped by the needs and priorities of communities and of policymakers, of legislators um, in our neck of the woods. So we built a research center that is comprised of three cores. Our research core houses six scientific studies, which I'll share a little bit more about, um, as well as an education and training core in a translation and community engagement core. So I just wanted to take this time to provide an overview of that. Um, and then maybe uh, I've been compelled. I wasn't, I can talk about RISE all day long in my sleep. And I wasn't sure, I didn't, uh, I've had many formal presentations, but I'm, I now know what I'm compelled to share uh, in this presentation. So I'll, I'll give some examples of the challenges that we've faced in trying to do this work and translate this work. Um, but first, um, the mission of RISE, I mean, oh, at the end of the day, we're not doing research, and I think Scott alluded to this earlier, we're not doing research for just research's sake, right? We're doing research to have it to be used to improve the health and well-being of our communities, and certainly RISE is doing that. We're taking a multidisciplinary approach to that and specifically thinking about the, south, the Southeast. Um, so in terms of our research core, we have policies, we have studies, most of which directly address some type of mixed methods evaluation of reproductive health policies that have that Georgia as well as Alabama and Mississippi have faced over the last few years, um, and we also have um, a real mission to understand the social, the social and cultural context at which those policies are developed and implemented, and how can we improve. Uh, promote more positive and healthy community norms that may, at the end of the day, help influence policymakers 
it could be wishful thinking, but I'll talk more about that particular project. Um, so we, the first project is um, entitled The Changing Landscape of Publicly Funded Reproductive Health Care. So this project looks at Title X in the role of federal policy that's shifted down to the states in providing publicly funded con contraceptive services. So this is not an abortion focus project, but um, RISE really does um, uh, con consider the whole range of reproductive health issues. Abortion is one position on that continuum. Um, we also have a policy looking at the impact of gestational age. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Project looking at the impact of gestational age policy on reproductive health care systems in the Southeast. This, um, this project is designed in response to Georgia's Georgia's and abortion abortion and services and quality of pregnancy resource centers or crisis pregnancy centers. Georgia is one of the states that uses, that has policies in place to allot major amounts of state funding to these centers. And as maybe some of you know, these centers have been understudied from um, an effectiveness model uh, in terms of healthcare delivery. So we have a major project that's looking at those centers. Um, we also have a project, which Rachel will talk more about in just a second, around confidentiality and parental involvement for minors seeking abortion services in Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. This project, um, at the heart of it is our interest in understanding what the judicial bypass project uh, process is like for young women, um, but it's much more broad than that, and it entails the roles in which providers play and which legal um, processes play in shaping confidentiality and access to care as a human right for young women um, seeking services. And then finally, our um, uh, community-focused project and our intervention-focused project is engaging Georgia communities for promoting reproductive health. So this is a multi-level community organizing intervention project that's aiming at reducing abortion stigma. Policy is a piece of this, but it's much more broad in terms of thinking about the social context um, of acceptability of abortion, um, as well as other reproductive health issues. We are focusing on faith-based context for that study, so that's a very interesting study, and it's in its early stages. I would say from a research methods perspective, RISE was designed um, to be highly interdisciplinary. So our team, I'm honored to be working with a huge team of investigators and staff and students and trainees um, across disciplines, all across Emory, as well as um, um, some of our local organizations. So we have public health and epidemiologists like myself at the table. We have many physicians and OBGYN providers, um, but we also have nursing and sociology and women's studies um, and law. Um, so we are striving to bring interdisciplinary frameworks and interdisciplinary methods to really think about these critical issues. Um, and we also are taking a very mixed methods approach. I like that both Patty and David alluded to the role of quantitative data and the role of epidemiologic surveillance, which we use every day, but also the complementary piece of qualitative methods and how we can um, marry those two things. So all of our projects have multiple sub-studies sub involved, multiple methodologies, and they're quite comprehensive um, in terms of looking at the different dimensions of these policies and these service delivery issues. Um, I will say we have been honored to work with Lindsay and um, Scott and Rachel on um, Law Atlas and using some of the most amazing and rich um, abortion surveillance data. Um, one of our, one of my PhD students actually is working on um, looking at um, a whole scale of the laws that have been, um, the legal text that which has been analyzed and how they shape, um, how dimensions of those laws shape um, maternal outcomes, including maternal mortality, as well as um, infant outcomes and morbidity outcomes. Um, so we are honored to be able to use those data um, as a piece of our um, research program. Um, so in terms of our um, 
education um, core, we have we are training PhD students and postdoctoral fellows, um, as well as master's level students and actually now undergraduate students, we have a whole pipeline um, approach and so um, we are really trying to recruit students from these diverse disciplines who are committed and excited to um, be doing this work in the southeast and to staying in the southeast and continuing to build capacity. In regards to our translation core, um, our translation core was really designed with the notion of how can our research questions be informed by the needs and priorities of our policy and advocacy and community partners, but then in turn, how can we do a much better job as scientists of translating those findings back for social and policy change? There's major gaps there historically in the field, especially when it comes to family planning. And so we're being very thoughtful and um, having lots of community engagement on better ways that we can quote unquote, flip the research paradigm, uh, if you will. And so it's, it's, it's the thing that I always say, I lose sleep over the most at night because it's building trust and building relationships takes a lot of time. And the reality is for us at least, the research timeline does not move fast enough for the legislation and the policymaking timeline, especially as Lindsay described over the last year, we've seen such an onslaught, an aggressive onslaught of uh, introduction of bills, including in Georgia. Um, and I think, I think I wanted to comment, and I hope I have a little bit more time, uh, to comment on our experience with one of those bills. Um, so mo in the most recent legislative session in Georgia, um, HB 481 was up, which is um, Georgia's six-week abortion ban or the heartbeat bill. Um, this essentially is in conflict with Roe and uh, is one of the most aggressive bills in the country right now that's, um, that's actually been passed by our governor. And it was it was passed fairly quickly um, and we weren't surprised, um, but it was interesting to be, a, I would say, a budding research center trying to develop an, a base of evidence to inform policy when such an aggressive policy was um, being quite widely accepted in our House and in our Senate. Um, and so my team, my um, representatives from my team of scientists as well as medical providers got to be intimately, intimately involved in representing research and representing medicine at the table for those sessions. Um, so we provided expert testimonies. We did a really good job at trying to represent the, the amazing work by Guttmacher and by others that came before us about what we know about the harms of these restrictive laws. We wrote policy briefs. We shared them with uh, our representatives and on the front lines. Um, and it was very difficult experience, quite frankly. And you know, at the end of the day, the law was passed. And I think we learned a lot about uh, what evidence might mean. And so I think my challenge to this conversation today and the questions that I have are, how can we um, be more effective in, um, how can the science be more effective? Like that's my major goal with RISE and I don't have the answers, but we sort of learned firsthand how hard that this road is gonna be right now in this political climate um, as it relates to abortion. And I think uh, the abortion extremism comment is really an important one um, because it's true, right? And so what we see from the justification and the context of the law, the bills that were being proposed, or that those were in conflict with a hundred years of science and established science and medicine. The text that's in the HB 41, for instance, is. And so um, the theater of the absurd at which it was, is was so interesting for our team to try to wrap our heads around and figure out how how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna do a better job at designing a whole research program that's intention is to inform more positive and proactive and po like protective policies for reproductive health care access? Um, so I feel like um, we have our work cut out for us and I don't have the answers, but I wanted to pose that as an example of the challenges of doing this work, but thank you. Uh, thank you. I am delighted to be part of this panel and part of this discussion. Um, as Kelly mentioned, I will describe the confidentiality and parental involvement project, which um, I'm a co-investigator for, um, in a little bit more detail. And um, I'm going to pick up where David left off, I think, in introducing parental involvement laws. Um, as, he, as he alluded to, 37 states require uh, parental notice or parental consent for a minor's abortion, 
And the three stats, uh, states that uh, RISE uh, is studying, Georgia, will requires notice to one parent, Alabama, uh, consent of one parent, and Mississippi, consent of both parents. So almost every state, just for those of you unfamiliar with what the judicial bypass process is, um, almost every state permits an alternative to parental involvement in the form of a court hearing, the judicial bypass. Uh, the judicial bypass has its origins in a Supreme Court case, Bilotti v. Baird, that held that state parental involvement requirements are constitutional only if the law includes an alternative process that is confidential and expedient. Um, parental involvement laws are constitutional so long as they allow minors who demonstrate that they are either mature enough to make an abortion decision or that it is in their best interest to bypass parental approval. Um, if a minor satisfies either ground, uh, the petition must be granted according to Bellotti versus Baird. Now, let's leave for Q&A the gap between law and practice. But there are, other several, there are several other aspects of the process that are also regulated by state law. State statutes can provide minors access to court-appointed counsel, guardians ad litem. Laws also govern venue. In Georgia, for instance, a minor may file petition in any juvenile court. Um, court proceedings are sealed to protect anonymity, and there are mechanisms for the speed of the process. So a Georgia court, for instance, must uh, issue an order within 24 hours of the hearing. Some states, for example, uh, provide uh, uh, for granting a petition if a judge enters no order. I just flag here, this is a really interesting area to watch because states are looking back on their parental involvement laws, opening them back up and revising them in order to make them stricter. So Texas, for instance, was a state that if the no order had been entered, the petition was deemed granted, revised its law in 2016. If no order is entered, which some judges had been accustomed to do, um, now the petition is deemed denied. So just to flag that area of uh, uh, legislative activity in the United States. So RISE's research uh, joins, I think, a conversation among studies that uh, uh, provide evidence of the health consequences of parental involvement laws. Uh, studies across the country show correlation between parental involvement and increased average gestational age at the time of abortion. Some of the research that Patty mentioned at the global level. Um, so for example, after Missouri uh, passed its parental involvement law, the proportion of second trimester abortions among minors increased by 17%. And as Patty also noticed, we believe that parental involvement laws increase costs and delay, which can correlate to higher incidence of unplanned parenthood, extra legal abortion, with related education, employment, income, and health consequences. So just to talk about the uh, RISE approach uh, with some more specificity, um, the objectives of the study are to describe the delivery of abortion care to minors and the experiences of minors, lawyers, clinicians, and other stakeholders in the Southeast, as well as to estimate the numbers, trends, and outcomes of minors seeking abortions. So the study's approach is both qualitative and quantitative depends on in-depth interviews with abortion clinic staff in Mississippi, Georgia, and Alabama, um, using a double-coded double coding process in partnership with nine abortion clinics, interviews with legal stakeholders, interviews with minors seeking abortion care, an aspect of the project I'm very excited about because I think there's been a real gap in studies of parental involvement laws in thinking uh, in, 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 in gathering the um, reactions and opinions of minors who have been through the process, abstraction of information from medical and administrative records, and the newest aspect of CPI, conducting mystery calls with county courts. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. In the rest of my time, however, I wanna to touch on a few emerging themes based on clinic interviews so far. First, the documentation of parental relationship and minor's identity. Second, clinical staff as counselors and gatekeepers to the judicial bypass process. And finally, the readiness of court staff to assist petitioners. So number one, 
uh, documentation of parental relationships can be difficult. Also, I think David's uh, 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 interview with the patient, the, the story that he told really gets at the heart of this. And I, I don't think it can be understated. Um, clinical staff are vigilant about ensuring complete information, but often clinics impose requirements not mandated by law that create additional hurdles to care. So as stated by one interviewee, we remind the parent that's coming that they need to bring an original birth certificate that has to have the parent's legal name on it, and it has to match their driver's license. If they got married again, we need another marriage license. If you got divorced, then we're going to need that marriage license and that divorce license and something to indicate what name matches the birth certificate. And sometimes that can be very problematic for some people. <laughs> I'd imagine. Um, the takeaway, documentation required by a clinic can present <laughs> obstacles that can be insurmountable, excluding or forcing into the bypass process or into a, another set of choices, minors who have told their parents about their abortion decisions, their pregnancies or the like, but parents who are having trouble meeting the requirements uh, uh, of a clinic. Uh, clinic staff frequently adopt roles of counselor or parent-child mediator, and some statements evidence their concern about coercion. Um, so uh, as recounted by an interviewee, I make it clear to the parents, sometimes they're very upset and yelling and screaming, but we continue through the process and they begin to calm down and understand with the young lady. We're like, look, it's your right. Be able, you are able to decide this, no one else can, but it's going to be really hard. And if you decide that's not what you want, there are other avenues other than being here. So clinical staff often feel under the microscope and express concerns about liability, backlash, coercion. Relatedly, options other than in-person parental consent are not offered to all minor patients. So clinicians noted describing the bypass only to minors they thought capable of navigating the process. Um, <clears throat> so the last theme, uh, this newest aspect of the, the mystery court calls is the plan of, uh, RISE plans to call 149 county courts in, in Georgia, um, following a semi-structured script asking on behalf of a friend about bypass requirements, cost, confidentiality, uh, the need for legal representation. Uh, the calls will be audio recorded uh, and callers complete red cap forms to capture details. Those details, for instance, include information on the respondent's demeanor or tone, any referrals she's given, the outcomes and responses. Was there, was the call answered? Was there a voicemail? Were you provided information? What did the court staff say? No, I don't know. Uh, did they transfer you? Um, and I think it's fair to say, uh, though we could talk about it more in Q&A, that uh, from early calls, it's clear that information on the judicial bypass is incomplete and inconsistent. And this tracks similar studies of uh, other uh, uh, calls made in states seeking the same information. Who knows what happens uh, uh, in the bypass process? Where is the hub of the network that can assist you in navigating a court hearing. So I think uh, I'll save for Q&A the next steps uh, in the study um, and uh, just conclude as the others have by noting that really the, 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 the work of this project is to try to fill, fill the public health data gap in the Southeast. Um, what I think everyone on the panel is hoping to accomplish in their research um, because I think we all believe that this kind of information is increasingly important, important in litigation, as we saw in Whole Women's Health, the Supreme Court's last word on abortion, but probably not for long, um, and in uh, targeting and helping shape reform strategies employed by health and legal advocates. So with that, I will turn, uh, turn it over to all of you, and thank you. Thank you so much to our panelists. Um, I think that we can all be in agreement that today's legal landscape as it relates to abortion regulation is complicated. Um, I think that there's a lot more work to be done, but it was so exciting to hear about the diverse work of our panel 
Um, and they have also alluded to one project that lives on our website, which is lawatlas.org, in which we distilled 16 different subdomains of abortion and coded over 37,000 variables across every state, including case law. Um, so you can check that out. That data is freely available. We hope that you do if you are unfamiliar with it. Um, but for the sake of time and because uh, David will be leaving us first, um, I want to open up to the panelists and see if you have any specific questions for David. And if not, we'll toss it to the audience. Okay, so we'll open it up to audience questions. Um, if none immediately for David, Free, free range. Sorry. Um, super interesting your stories. I wonder, um, has any, uh, I, I know the issues, right, with respect to um, laws about the speech of crisis pregnancy centers, the NFIB case, but I wonder, uh, NIFLA, excuse me. Um, I wonder, has any action been taken by the states, do you know of, not at sort of that level of regulating speech, but of uh, doing some kind of enforcement action for the kind of individual interaction that you describe, you know, either for fraud, harassment, um, like we can think of a lot of different things, and including also, you know, practicing medicine without a license. Um, so there are barriers to a lot of this um, because of fine details of how they operate. So, for instance, there are a bunch of states that um, consumer protection laws, for instance, or false advertising by business laws, um, don't apply to the clinics because they don't charge. So when the services are offered free of charge, they can do whatever they want. Um, so that's been a problem, right? And then you get a problem of, um, you know, in theory, you can imagine a world in which someone goes to a clinic, is told that they're further along than they are, so they don't seek an abortion, or vice versa. They're told they're um, not as far as they are, and then they wait because they think they have time to make a decision or get their ducks in a row to get the procedure, and then they're too late. Um, a lot of states ban lawsuits for wrongful birth, so you can't bring a lawsuit to then challenge the clinic. It also requires someone to actually step forward and say, I was deceived and I went to a clinic that wasn't a clinic and the shame and stigma around that added on to the shame and stigma around abortion. So it's really hard. Um, the NIFLA case, certainly, which was a Supreme Court case, it's a year old at this point, which California tried to regulate abortion, uh, fake clinics by saying that they had to um, say they were not a medically licensed facility. And then for some of them that were actually medically licensed, they had to say that California has free access to abortion and contraceptive services if they call the Department of Health or something like that. Um, and the Supreme Court struck down that law saying that that was compelled speech. Um, and so I think a lot of places have gone back to the drawing board to try and figure out what they can do. Um, there's an ordinance in Hartford that um, there was a, a different requirement, what the clinics had to say in terms of saying that they are not a real abortion clinic that um, survived without a challenge post NIFLA for about eight months. And then it, the lawsuit was brought in the spring and that's going to be challenged um, and that's ongoing. So the free speech issues are really challenging here, and the Supreme Court has all but said that we are going to let fake clinics do what they want, but it's okay for states to um, uh, regulate abortion providers and force abortion providers to say things they don't want to say because abortion providers are engaging in the practice of medicine and long been held that states have an interest in regulating the practice of medicine 
and requiring as part of informed consent that doctors and other medical professionals inform patients about the nature of the procedure. So when the state tells a real clinic that it has to say things, they don't have First Amendment rights. When the state tells a fake clinic that they have to say things, that they have First Amendment rights. It's right? a bizarre world, world, but that's what that's happening. That's what that's happening. That's what can I make Can one additional comment to that? that yes, if we take that, that to the to the sort of side, side extreme, extreme what we're what saying now, now to, to, to is the is the death gag gag or title 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 I um, rushed, and so I think that that's a major research uh, sort of issue that's happening right now that some people are scrambling to try to say, can we study this in real time as these, this is rolling out, and what are the implications of it? Hi, uh, I'm a little older than some of you, and I remember a big thing about RU486, and it would free up women uh, to uh, carry on as they wished. What's happening with that? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, similar to the, um, the kind of address is, is being addressed a little bit in the medical Board. I can speak from the um, kind of international context and not in the U.S. context, although there's some similarities. Um, in the U.S. context, I understand that the same restrictions to abortion with pills in the U.S. is usually mifepristone with misoprostol apply to surgical abortion. I mean, because of this weird, nonsensical regulatory environment in the U.S. that um, that barriers are just continuing to put up. So the fact that there's an easier way to do abortion doesn't really matter to the U.S. regulatory context. Um, and globally, we're trying to make progress on the issue, but the law, I mean, the law does not move as quickly as medical developments. Um, and so, so RU-46, a medical abortion pill, um, it's either uh, together mifepristone and misoprostol or misoprostol alone. Misoprostol alone is cheap, accessible all over the world. It's actually a um, drug for um, ulcers that people can get, but the laws still are addressing abortion as though it's a process that needs a medical provider or a doctor or a nurse or a, um, or a midwife. So we do have this revolutionary, um, this revolutionary method for abortion out there. It's, it's not even new anymore, um, but the laws in the US because of the opposition and then all over the world, just because laws don't change very quickly, are still treating abortion as though it's something that needs to be done in a healthcare setting surgically with um, with aspiration. Yes, I would agree, and I would just add that uh, the most timely conversations around medical abortion in um, the U.S. right now are around the ways uh, policies are restricting access to it, uh, um, as it is an option um, that is could have the potential. Uh, a, to meet any kind of post-row conversation, um, for instance, um, but also the ways in which it has the potential to address rural gaps in access to care and other types of um, disparities in access to care that we see. Um, so, for instance, the regulation of uh, medication abortion provision with certain types of providers. So there's laws that focus on um, the, the types of providers that can administer medication abortion, the ways in which it can be administered. So there's regulations on, for instance, can it happen um, via telemedicine? Um, so there's uh, th this, this, I think the, the legal context of medication abortion regulation is kind of a hot topic right now. Um, and there's also some questions um, at the FDA level that I'm not as familiar with, but um, it is a hot topic. I'm glad you asked. And it's been well established form of, of abortion in this country for a long time now. So um, it's, another, it's another tool that's being used. Thank you. I just, can I just add one more thing, which is that there are people out there who are involved in some really innovative ways of thinking about the delivery of medication abortion that um, say abortion by mail, um, over-the-counter abortion, um, 
uh, abortion by the internet, um, that the, um, there was just a lawsuit brought this week by a woman who, um, Rebecca Gompertz, who's a doctor in another part of the world, I forget what country, Netherlands, um, and she has provided service in Europe to people abortion by mail, abortion pills by mail, and is trying to bring that to the United States, and the FDA has stopped her, and she brought a lawsuit this week in federal court claiming that it violates her patient's constitutional rights to prevent her from providing abortion pills by mail. Um, so I think the, the promise is there, the revolutionary promise is there, it's just the law is getting in the way, um, and the hope is that sometime in the near future, the law will disappear, get out of the way and let this development do what it really could do. But it only helps people below 10 weeks right now. Um, and so it will, it, unless there's some radical change in the medicine, um, we still have the need for surgical abortion post 10 weeks. And so medical abortion will never solve the problem entirely because of the post 10 weeks. And these barriers like waiting periods and other uh, clinic protection laws and all of this pushes people out of the 10 weeks so quickly. Um, and the negative health outcomes are up. But I have read so much about all of this work and an op-ed in the New York Times did suggest that women or people of means in countries where you can access abortion drugs should consider just having it ready. So you can give it to people who might need it, who can't access it. Can you point someone to, is, I think that's criminalized. I don't know. How could I figure that out? Like, or just like, what could a regular person do? Like, I know there's, this, there's so much. Um, that's a great question, uh, and I think David was referencing a group that is formed, uh, that's based in California, that uh, is looking at self-induced abortion, self-managed abortion, and thinking about the variety of ways that it could be normalized, made available, but running up against just what you mentioned, a raft of criminal and civil penalties that could be applied to a person who gives out uh, medical abortion or who takes <laughs> medical abortion in contravention. Uh, to the state's laws. And so it, it's a risky, um, there are people actively working to make that less risky, but it is still in a context of legal liability that, 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 makes, it, uh, that, that makes self-managed abortion a challenge. And to add to that, it's not just the law in the books. Um, there are all kinds of laws that could be used to prosecute someone who has pills um, and prescribes abortion. I mean, uh, homicide laws have been used for people who have abortion. So, you, I mean, we've got a lot of zealot prosecutors all over the country. And so even if the laws are perfect, they're still gonna find a way to prosecute abortion if they want to. And so, um, and so it's not just um, an, another sort of use of legal epidemiology is kind of figuring out what the risk is. You have the law in the books and then getting into some criminology studies of what is the enforcement, what are the real risks um, to, figuring, to figuring that out. But, um, but the U.S. is a really dangerous context, I mean, compared to where I work, because of, because of all of the anti-abortion zealotry that's in the government um, at every level. Okay. Uh, what about after uh, an abortion? What support is there? Because it's, I'm sure it's traumatic, contentious. What support groups or counselors or uh, whatever are available to women or couples or uh, women couples and families? Uh, uh, are, uh, is there something to help uh, people get through the, the uh, uh, what I think is probably traumatic in different ways? I'll come on, on that first. Um, thank you for that question. I think um, we, there, uh, well, I would say what the public health and medical consensus is, is that abortion isn't, is very much an individual experience. And so for some women, it may be traumatic and for other women, it may be a relief. So there's not, um, there is a clear body of evidence to suggest that abortion does not cause mental health morbidity. So I'll say that first. And that's actually one of my areas of expertise. Um, but I do very much appreciate your question because for some women, it would be stressful. I mean, I think the public health goal is 
no one should have to have an abortion. We should prevent unintended pregnancies. And so abortion is not a goal. Access to comprehensive care is. Um, there are plenty of services for women who need them. And I think that um, from my perspective, as well as my clinical background, um, there are um, strong resources um, uh, that women often have the option of being referred to if needed. Not all women need those, some women need those. Um, and those range in scope and opportunity in terms of the types of resources needed. I think it, again, it would be a very individualized experience from a from sort of a uh, health systems or infrastructure perspective. There are really effective models of collaborative care where abortion providers or abortion clinics often work very closely with um, social workers, psychologists, uh, when those are needed. Um, the other major piece of it is for women who don't want to have an unintended pregnancy, which the majority of them don't, um, and a certainly repeat unintended pregnancy, um, how can they get linked with preventative services such as contraception when that is a desired um, next step. So I think there are integrated models of care happening. The problem, at least that we see in the Southeast, is um, places like Atlanta, who have a large um, uh, representation of abortion providers, also are the same people who have a really lovely network of care access, where it's easy to refer somebody if they need to talk to a counselor afterwards. Um, all um, providers are doing counseling um, preemptively in the clinics before the abortion, making sure that's a share, that's a decision that's completely driven by the patient. Um, but, you know, clinics, abortion clinics, partially because the laws that restrict the funding for them to do comprehensive services are limited in resources sometimes, especially in the most rural areas. Um, but some of that is just my um, understanding of the medical landscape. So it's not necessarily a one size fits all. Yeah, oh, well, I'll speak to Georgia. Um, I, so one of the things I didn't mention is that my center works um, with more than 20 different um, community partners, community advocacy partners, clinical partners. And so, yes, I think local networks have become quite um, proficient as they've had to become of um, collabor collaborating. And so, for instance, um, the National Abortion Federation is a national level organization that um, has a hotline where women are connected with right away if they need certain types of services, and that can range the full scope of services. Um, Georgia and Atlanta in particular has, I don't know, I would say 10 to 15 good organizations that are part of that local network. So, um, but that net, Atlanta is not represent, representative of the entire U.S. where those resources are less um, robust. Okay, we'll take maybe one more question from the audience if there is one, and then. So, you know, when we were talking about city health, I mean, we had this sort of list of things we think cities should do. It's very positive, and you advocate for that in a particular way. And then we have this preemption issue, which for a long time was something where it seemed like actually cities and, and, and forces promoting health needed to get their act together, recognize what was going on, recognize that there was a systematic effort to induce preemption across regulatory domains and start to react more effectively. Trying to happen now. So, you know, in a way, abortion is a, is, is a really old fight of that kind. It's, it's largely about fighting bad stuff happening. That's what the focus is. There's, you know, the best stuff is just leave us alone. Be kind of like a, a rational thing, at least in some things. So, what we can do with evidence and how we can do it and how you know policy you know policy surveillance can help etc it's, it's quite a different situation so i'm just wondering if you all can comment on what do you think we can be doing in research and policy surveillance in the web epidemiology to and you know to to be positive forces in this um uh, in this battle i'll just quickly say and then turn it over to kelly and patty um that actually there's there's concerted efforts to pass legislation and pass policies, uh, create uh, uh, capacity at community levels that is proactive uh, in, in, in securing reproductive health care for, uh, for people. And so New York is a good example of drafting laws that uh, provide resources that are not just reactive. And so the thinking is there. 
that the strategy needs to be less reactive, more proactive, um, and using the, the, the kind of research that we're describing to target what areas uh, where, you know, contraceptive coverage and, and the like, self-managed abortion, these are all examples of more proactive thinking about how you could um, promote re women's reproductive health care, people's reproductive health care in ways that are not just defensive to state legislation. And I was going to comment on that too, and I think that our charge as researchers or scientists is to evaluate what's working. What are the factors that are enabling these positive and supportive and resilient contexts? Um, obviously, the socio-contextual uh, place of New York or Oregon is another example, or California is another example is not Georgia or, you know, Alabama, Mississippi, but I think there, there's a lot of lessons learned from those experiences. Um, one of my clinic partners in um, Atlanta had proposed a really beautiful comprehensive bill to address reproductive health services across the spectrum, and of course it didn't get passed, but it made some good headway, it drew, drew a lot of attention, and the, uh, and our partners, our policy partners, um, are fighting this fight and not giving up. And so I think, you know, it's really hard to have the time and resources and energy to do that at the same time while having to be so reactive to these emergencies and these fires that we're constantly pulling out to make, pulling off to make sure that things aren't getting passed that are just dire, for instance, HB 41. But um, there are lessons learned. So that's where the data comes in to study these different states um, as effective models. Yeah, no, uh, and what I'll add is that, um, is that, I mean, abortion is different not only because it's in the criminal law, but in, in the U.S. and really everywhere it's so polarized. It's not, it's not health. It's the abortion issue that people talk about, and it's, sometimes it's grounded in rights, and so that makes it just different. But it, it just, just the approach of using research to mainstream abortion to look at, you know, the center looks at the impact of laws on, of public health laws on, on outcomes, and then just by virtue of adding abortion to, to the list of health issues, um, that we study really reinforces the fact that abortion is a health issue, just like any other health issue. It's regulated in a very bizarre way, but, um, but really, you know, putting it on a list with all the other issues that are um, relevant and interesting for study, um, I think moves us, moves the needle forward a little bit in terms of um, destigmatizing abortion for folks who are working and health rather than making it this this polarized issue that it that it really is right now maybe i'll make one final comment to that because i couldn't agree more and i think it ties in beautifully with what we heard from the first panel collectively which i saw as an important theme is what is the effective communication strategy what is the messaging strategy how can we find common ground um how can we take a positive frame and i think that our our field grapples with that as much as anybody in terms of a policy context. And I don't believe that we know the answers yet, um, but we're starting to think about the access to care issue as something we all can agree on, the human rights angle, that's something we can all agree on, the autonomy, the bodily autonomy, something we can all agree on, but then um, how does that translate to effective policy making? Jury's out on that, but I think that, we, that those are things that we're actively thinking about in the field. Okay, burning questions, Mayor? A question about to what extent legal epi is really a catalyst for organizing because ultimately um, policies require political power and in many contexts that's really you know the crux of the issue so so where do we how do we take legal epi and turn it into um, you know being a catalyst for change so one interesting idea that underlies that question is the idea that abortion is too political to change. Um, and that's not what you said explicitly, but it implicitly is something I hear all the time. And <clears throat> I just don't agree. I mean, I, I, it is politically charged, but as someone who does a lot of public health-minded research in this area, um, I am constantly surprised by the networks the very the differing networks of people who are thinking about um, reform strategies, policy, but also thinking about the use of uh, reproductive health data in ways that track legal epi across drug policy, across housing policy, that are not 
completely dissimilar. And one, um, one similarity, for instance, is um, what some of Rise's research, there are, there are some really interesting early conclusions that show some policies work just fine. Um, some policies don't have the unintended or negative consequences that we that abortion supporters might assume they have. And so why focus our attention on those on those policies? Why not focus our attention on other interventions that are maybe a little less uh, commonly thought of as effective interventions in <clears throat> in in reproductive health care or for abortion policy? So um, I, I hope that wasn't too confrontational, but <laughs> I like the question. But I just disagree with the premise. Um, I agree with you, and I think that is our that's our real experience. And then, how do you implement that or create an understanding of that with communities and with partners? Is kind of where we're at right now. So um, I think that's where my translation core of my center comes in most important. This is probably the most important work that we're doing, right? And I think we saw it play out with HB four eighty one, where we are working hand in hand in constant communication with what what the partners are facing sort of on the front lines, um, even the representatives and senators who have certain data needs for um, the ways in which those bills are being shaped or the ways in which the um, hearings are happening. Um, and so I think that there's room there. We um, collaborate with the um, Center for Reproductive Rights and If, When, How and some of the, uh, the ACLU. And so trying to understand what are the actual, what would be useful evidence um, in order to help better inform those policies? Because I think that scientists' traditional notion of that isn't always the right answer or the most effective way. So we're trying to work very closely to understand what that should be and what that looks like. And I think m many of you probably know better than I, it's a moving target sometimes, and it's not always clear what the right what the right frame would be or what the right piece of data would be at any given moment. Um, and we've been a bit surprised about that. So it's hard to be prepared for all of it, but um, kind of being nimble and being able to, um, being able to speak to the true um, lived experiences of patients and providers and communities is what we're attempting to do. And the, the true impetus for our original abortion law project from our partners at Goatmacher and CRR and Planned Parenthood and we really got this whole powerhouse team together to work on this, was they wanted to embolden their trial attorneys to be able to see the state of the law in Q&A format on a prospective basis. So get this data done, of course, but please put it in a format that we can easily digest, you know, every minute of the day and include case law because we need to know if this statute is enjoined or you know, where do we go from here? So that was, uh, the advocacy piece of this was very important um, to our initial project. And I think that it, it's such a good point and I'm happy we all touched on that. Um, and I think leveraging partnerships, like you all said, because there are a lot of amazing organizations working within this space and there's a lot of work to be done. Um, yeah, okay, thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists and all the participation.